Okay, so we, we will start discussing, right? All right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, so can I just start by saying, you know, the title of your chapter is um, Stop to Appreciate Gene's Legacy and Then Step Forward, Developments from Gendlin's Focusing. And right. I wonder whether you could say something both about your chapter and why you chose that particular topic and also if you could say something about um, the publication of these two volumes at this particular time because you're you you know what the contents are you have um, you you know the contents of the two volumes and you know the range that it covers yes yeah well i guess what i really wanted to um, I guess I, I have two aspects that I want to to bring forth in in this chapter, and uh, one is to really appreciate Jean's legacy, um, Jean's Jenlin's focusing. Um, um, and that's because there are many developments from genes focusing and many people have their own ways of teaching focusing. And sometimes we lose sight of what it was originally. <coughs> Excuse me. So I wanted to stay with the, appreciate the original um, Jenlin's focusing. So th that's one aspect that I've been working on for many years to, to stay with what might be called uh, orthodox focusing. Um, and one time when I was teaching in the Focusing Institute summer school with um, <clears throat> Uh, several other teachers of focusing, they all had their originals, original focusing. Mm -hmm. It, it might have been whole body focusing or with, with some new name. And then I thought, gosh, I don't, I don't have anything original <laughs> because <laughs> I've just been working with Jenlin's focusing. But um, so at the time I thought, um, I better start doing something original. <clears throat> but now that I think of it, I guess it's one of my strengths to, to keep digging mm -hmm. um, into Jenlin's focusing. And at the same time, there's been um, a different kind of channel in me. Um, from which I started to develop my own things. And so it's like I had like at least two separate channels in me. One is the really genes focusing and the other one is my original. And, um, and somehow I, it, it didn't seem right to me to mix them up. Mm -hmm. So that's reflected in the title of this chapter, Stop to Appreciate Gene's Legacy, and then Step Forward. So I, I do like to appreciate Gene's focusing. And, and write about that with clarity. But then I want to also step forward and introduce what I'm developing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a way for me to, to keep both of them authentic. This might really be the, the one of the highlights of this whole book, this, this whole two volume books, because we do want to keep Jenlin's focusing as a basis. And then all these people are developing from there. 
So although it's somewhat of a lengthy and clumsy title, I thought it would be nice for my for my chapter. And I, one of the things that I, when I was rereading your chapter, I, you are so, you have such a deep understanding of focusing on the origins of it and the whole concept of experiencing. And I was thinking that, do you, do you have concerns when you talk about, you know, people developing in different directions, that maybe some of the the original depth of the approach or the the practice or whatever it is might get lost. Mm. I do sometimes actually, mm. um, but it's 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 good to have new things come out. So I do appreciate the new things, um, but. Um, I, I, it's somewhat concerning if they interpret focusing in their own way. Um, so they might say focusing is some, like this and such and such and such. And that description already has their flavor on it, you know? So I didn't want to get in, I didn't want to um, produce something like that. So I wanted to keep Jean's original flavor and my flavor separately. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Akira, I, what I see personally in your, uh, let's say, work, in your uh, writings about focusing, is that you also care about <clears throat> connecting Jean's um, work philosophy with its origins in dill ties etc mm -hmm. and i see uh, your effort to to apply the hermeneutic cycle experiencing re-experiencing in in the focusing world into focusing I, am i right you, you... i i think gene had had that hmm. And, um, but he never really said very much about it. He did say a little, but he didn't say very much about it. But, but you say, you say more about I it. I say more because I want yeah. to bring that out. Yes. Mm. Yes. One, but... of the, one of the uh, good things and bad things about Gene's writings um, is that um, he is very original, of course. And the bad side of that is he doesn't really say where his, where his thoughts come from. Mm -hmm. And he does that in many places, right? Um, for example, in the book Focusing, there's, a, there's some reference to the experiencing scale. Um, and about psychotherapy research. And it reads as if Gene did all the research. Yeah. yeah. But actually, the, the, in the experiencing scale, Gene was the fourth author. So there was a lot of other things that came before him and that he, he collaborated with. Um, and that really is not sort of um, brought out to light very much. And I think the same with focusing uh, in terms of the basis of focusing in hermeneutics, for example, or in, in phenomenology also. So I want people to understand that there's a whole history um, behind focusing, that, that focusing just wasn't made overnight. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. And uh, what I notice is, uh, since many people don't know this background, um, they try to infer or they try to um, read into it 
in their own ways. And then it gets to be very confusing. So I, I want to um, bring out the history behind Focusy. Mm. And I think by doing so, we can also um, carry forward Janet's ideas. And I'm, what I'm also really conscious of is that since um, Jendlin died in 2017, in a way, he's no longer there to protect his own legacy. Right. And it, and it felt to me that in your chapter, to some degree, you were, you were trying to do that. You were really trying to honour his legacy. Yes. While yes. also saying, and this is how I have carried this forward. Yes, yes. Um, and, I, and I suppose my concern is that that legacy will be lost in the sense that, you know, people bring their own flavour to it and... Yes. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, especially in the therapy and uh, self-help kind of uh, focusing. Um, context. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I think uh, just last month, was it? There was a, a Janlin symposium mm -hmm. saying what we mean. Um, and there, it was basically a philosopher's colloquium. And there they were really discussing the philosophical dimensions of the philosophical roots of, of Jenlin. Uh, and two books have been published after he died in, in philosophy. Yes. <clears throat> um, so I think, so, I think philosophers, um, somebody told me, I don't know if this is only in Japan or if it's only in the whole world, but they say um, a philosopher becomes honored after he is dead. Um, all the philosophers we study are dead, like Aristotle, Kant, and Hegel, and so forth. And if you're still living, they don't think of you as a, a first-class philosopher <laughs> in some way. So um, I think the Gene's legacy in philosophy is right, just about starting up mm. on, 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 on the philosophy side. Yeah. And in the psychology side, I think people are rushing very much to develop their own things that the legacy might be corrupted is not a good word, but um, interpret it in their own terms. Yes. I, I see what you say about um, this beginning of uh, uh, acknowledging, let's say, Gentleness legacy in, in, right. in the, in the f philosophy right, uh, yeah. world. Uh, uh, um, Donata, for example, uh, yes, he yes. Is, is building bridges. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I'm glad Donata is writing for this book. Yes, isn't she? Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. She is. But I I want to uh, to say this about re-experiencing. You use that term very often. Yeah. You use it to explain what is happening yeah. in therapy. Let's say. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Therapist yeah. re-experiences. Yes. <clears throat> the client situation yeah, yeah. okay yeah. would you like to say a little bit about that so so you you also you are building bridges also with diltais or yeah. hermeneutics right i say about um re-experiencing very much because uh, there is a translation of the word into Japanese. Uh, it comes from the German, as you know, mm -hmm. and there is a, 
there is a Japanese scholar that translated it very nicely. And so that word became very popular among the general public, that we use that word very much. And- um, You mean in, in Japan? In Japan. Yes. And I noticed also in China, hmm. and they use the same word. And so when once I did a workshop in Hong Kong, and uh, they said, uh, re-experiencing is much more useful as a concept than empathy, for example. Mm. And then the person um, looked up the Chinese dictionary for that word. And the dictionary said that it was a term that was coined by a Japanese scholar for a translation of Nakha 11. But many, very few people in China know that. They, they just think it's a word that was there from a long time ago. So it's a very popular word. And we always, like, we watch drama and re-experience the characters. <laughs> we watch, you know, you read a novel and you're re-experiencing the main character and so forth. So we use that word very much in Japan. And um, so people are familiar with it. And it's very interesting that there is no good English translation. So um, because there is no good English translation, the term has not been used in the psychotherapy context in UK or US. So that's, and I think you're missing out a lot <laughs> if you don't have that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've been- So re-experiencing is that. not a good English translation, you say? No. No. Okay. Because it can mean also to experience again. Yes, which is wrong. Which is wrong. Yes. This is actually what I wanted to say to you. Yes. Because yes. it sounds wrong to us. I mean, even yeah, we, it sounds wrong. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you take a term, <coughs> let's say the reading of a book, of uh, watching a, a film. So yeah. you, if you say we re-experience the characters, then something is not totally right. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. you meet the situations <laughs> of of the characters. It, yes, yes. And that's exactly what we are doing in therapy. Mm -hmm. when, when, the th when the client is talking about a situation, we are actually re-experiencing that situation. Um, and it's not necessarily empathy. So I think there is a distinction there. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and the key word really is experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I think that re-experiencing is such a, it's such a strange word in English. It has no, it has no particular meaning. Right. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. I'm very interested to hear what you're saying about Japan and China. Right. Yeah. That actually that word is already there and it is. It's already there. Yeah. It's like, already yeah. What, what is the, that word? I mean, in Japan, in Japanese, in, uh, can you write it to us? Can you say it? To, to... Yeah, I can say it. I can write it in the chat. Uh, it's very interesting. That's the Japanese, that's the <laughs> term in characters. And that's pronounced tsuitaiken in Japanese. Uh, in Japanese, tsuitaiken. And in Chinese, it's pronounced Tsui Tai Yin, which is close enough. In Hong Kong, it's pronounced something Tsui something, but the, it's written the same way. Mm. They're all the same when, it, when, when it's written. And the first character is, uh, this one means, usually means to follow. To follow. Yeah, so it's more like follow after experiencing. Hmm. And yes. the other two characters are experience, mean experience. So it's this is follow experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. 
<laughs> I like it more that, that in, in this way, follow. Yeah, this. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <coughs> These days, I always talk about them um, when I explain it in Japanese or in English too. I say that I used to have a golden retriever dog and the dog would always be sitting on my right side and sometimes leaning on, on me. And she would put her paw on my right foot so I could feel her paw on my, on my feet. And then she would, her face would be somewhere around here. Mm -hmm. And she would be sort of sniffing at me sometimes. And her mouth would always be open and sometimes she would drool. And the drool will be, um, will drop on my jeans. And so it, when I talk about that, you can re-experience not only the imagery, but also the warmth of the dog as she leans on me or how the paw feels on my feet or how, how the drool drips on my jeans and so forth. So it's a whole experience that you have there. And actually, when you think about it, uh, we don't really deal with recollections or memories in therapy. We actually re-experience the past mm -hmm. or we don't really recall dreams. Actually, we re-experience dreams as we talk about them. So I think, I think in, in many ways, I think it's a very rich term. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think the English speaking world is missing out a lot. <laughs> and yeah. that's why I want to talk about it. I think that's so interesting. And I, I, I know that focusing is very um, popular and successful in Japan. And do you think it is partly to do with the language? Because I think, I think language mm -hmm. is such a stumbling block in English uh, with regard to focusing and a lot of the terminology. It yes. just sounds strange and nonsensical. And, but maybe, you, you know, in Japan, that is, that is really different. And you're in the wonderful yes. position of knowing both fluently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I sometimes I say it to, to my Japanese colleagues about that, that mm. something in the Japanese language is very much open to the implicit. <coughs> For example, the, uh, uh, you know, the onomatopoeia. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> onomatopoeia. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. We use it in many different ways in, in Japanese. So we can have, uh, onomatopoeia is, is usually the sound, but uh, not only the sound, but uh, something like, I feel foggy in my chest, mm. something like that. Yes. And, and people would use those words very much in ordinary conversation because they don't have an accurate word to say that yet. Mm -hmm. So they will say something like, I don't know what I'm feeling, but I'm feeling foggy in my chest. So that's the felt sense right there, you know. So. Rich metaphoric language. Yeah. Uh, so making easy to explain new words. What the felt sense is. Making new yeah. words from. Right, 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 right. And then there's a bodily sense there of, in the chest, something there in the chest. Maybe I wrote about this, but maybe not. Um, there's an old Japanese expression, and this is usually done when you're scolding a child, but uh, they would say, um, a mother would say to a child, for example, um, put your hand on your chest and ask inside. <laughs> so it's like, uh, have you been have you been behaving today? And the kid will, will be saying, "Yeah, I'm behaving today." 
Are you sure? Put your hand on your chest and ask inside. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I think there is a sense that the chest knows more mm. than what you want to say with your head. Yes. So there's many expressions like that. So I, I think in some ways, uh, it's easier to communicate the implicit in Japanese. Hmm. Very, very Focusing fits Japan, <laughs> as we have it in, in, the, in the book. Uh, one of Gentlin's quotes from videos from Nadal, by Nadal Lu. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he said something like that, yeah. Yes. I think he was very impressed when he came here first the first time or the second time because of that, the richness of the implicit. Mm. Mm. And I remember, um, I can't remember where I read this, you know, that he was known as Dr. Zendlin. Mm. <laughs> Zendlin. <laughs> but can, can I just ask you, um, because you do make this really clear distinction in your chapter between what uh, what Jendlin wrote and what your own developments have been. And you very nicely talk about your My Channel. And, yes, 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 yes. And one of the things that you um, talk about in your My Channel is the, the blending of focusing and mindfulness. And I know, yes. I know you do a lot of meditation and I just wonder if you could say a little bit about that. And Akira, also about animals, crossing with animals. I, I would like very much to hear, to hear you say a, a few things about that. Because, okay, animals <laughs> have a place. <laughs> okay. Crossing with animals, well, we'll start from that side. Crossing with animals is very much in the Genlin experiencing framework. So it's the use of metaphors to say ex about experiencing. Um, because experiencing is not yet in words. So if you ask like, how are you living now? It's hard to say in, in words how that is. But if you could use a metaphor, um, it's, pro it's quite easy. And people, when they start to talk about the animals uh, for, let's say, 10 minutes, they, the animals would start to, to move on their own or change into something. And then they discover that it's really about themselves and, and their lives. So after speaking about, uh, after doing crossing with animals, then they discover what it really was that they are experiencing. It's that kind of carried forward was, is how I call it. So you discover something and you say, that was really what it was. So it's very, very much genuine in a sense. Um, and animals are embodied beings. So they could be big birds and they could be small birds. And um, when you express your sense of life as an animal, then it already is an embodied image, imagery that you're getting. So, so I've had some wonderful experiences with that. And, uh, and I've written about it in this, Book. I'm glad I wrote it here because this is the first time that it's being introduced in writing. Mm. I am happy that it happens. I mean, that you say and you write about uh, animals because we we br brutally use animals. Uh -huh. So I see also this side. It, it is a way of appreciating them, uh, the animals. Right. 
in a way, yes. And I thought it was very easy for people to have an imagery of um, animals. In fact, I stumbled upon it when I was teaching a class on psychotherapy theory. And I was wondering how, how can I teach about the self in Rogers and the self in Jenlin? And Jenlin doesn't write much about the self. <clears throat> so I said, if you were to express your real self as something, as any symbol, what would you be? And then I, I got lots of interesting answers, but um, many of them were animals. Mm. So then I thought, oh, animal metaphor must be really powerful for this. And that's how I got into crossing with animals. Mm -hmm. Right. And the mindfulness thing is, uh, Um, very important issue for me and I'm actually writing about it right now mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting that uh, um, some Buddhist monks have said that they've read the book focusing and they thought it was a Buddhist book, <laughs> you know? So I don't know where, what they reacted to or responded to, but um, there is some kind of similarity, similarity between Buddhism and focusing. And uh, there are some obvious parts of it, um, which is like uh, space, Mm -hmm. uh, and also about the transient nature of what we feel. Uh, like it seems to have a form, but then the form changes. So it's always experiencing and always in process. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we never know what we are because what we are is always in process. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And it's so, very interesting how it connects with the uh, crossing with animals as well. I mean, it's it's sort of carrying experiencing forward in a different way. Mm, 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 yeah. But how uh, do you distinguish between uh, mindfulness and focuses? If I'm focusing, how do I distinguish them? Yeah. Sorry. But one thing that I found, what I find very different, uh, it, it, and I'm mm, quite aware of this, is uh, I, I think focusing is very much uh, verbal. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, it is very much verbal, yeah. although, although there's an emphasis on the body and so forth, but yeah, it's actually... Yeah what's implicit in what we say and so saying and experiencing is very much uh, related and focusing is very verbal and mindfulness is not verbal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mindfulness practitioners tend to have a tend to i, I would say a distrust of verb of verbal <laughs> processes. So instead of thinking and saying, they would just stay quiet and yes. just let things go. Yes. And, and maybe that's why you combine them. Mm. It is like a complementarity issue here. <laughs> language and non-language. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Okay, I see, I see that. I, I see also the element of dialogue that experiencing mm. has language or knows how to speak. Or Yeah, yeah. 
has language in it. Uh, of course, yes. it has. Yes. 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 So, in some sense, it looks very different it, uh, at the start. But if you start digging, mm -hmm. then um, it might be not so different mm. as they would seem. Mm. Um, I was fortunate to be um, a moderator of a discussion between Rob Parker, who's teaching the process model, and Isho Fujita, who is a Zen monk. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a wonderful uh, discussion. It's uh, on video now. And I'm, they're trying to bring it over to, to the West so that because it was done in English and Rob Parker cannot speak in Japanese. So I, I was his Japanese voice. Yes. And Isho speaks both languages. So he would speak in both languages. Sometimes he would forget the Japanese and I had to remind him <laughs> to speak Japanese. <laughs> but it was a wonderful discussion. They seem to hit it along very well. Although they come from somewhat of a different place. Another thing that I'm bringing out in here is um, I don't know the English word. Attachment in Buddhism mm -hmm. <coughs> that suffering comes because we yeah. are attached to things. Yeah which are transient in the first place. So there's something about clearing a space where um, we are attached to so many things. And if we can put them at a distance, then we're not attached to these things. And then there is a, a sense of peace in you and there is a space in you. Mm -hmm. In fact, you, you could say that we are perfect beings mm -hmm. if we're not attached. <laughs> and, if we uh, have a space. <laughs> if we have space, that's right. So one thing that we could aim towards is to clear space, in other words, drop the attachments, mm. right? And this is a very much uh, mindfulness or, or Zen yeah. yes. kind of interpretation. Yes, yes. But um, I think there's something to that. I remember Gene told me about the time he came to Japan for the first time. And um, I met him first after he came back from Japan. And he was kept talking about Japan with me for, for a long time. And he said he had dreams of his mother living in Japan. And, um, and then he told me a story that he went to uh, a Zen temple in Nagano, I think he, he said. And he was uh, sitting there in, in Zen posture and and then the monk came over and looked at him sitting and monk looked at him and said, it looks like uh, you are, have a lot of uh, concerns. You have a lot of problems. So uh, why don't you put them down over here? One, two, three, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and Gene said, that's just like clearing a space. That's what I teach. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and and if, if we hear, if, someone from social psychology comes now and hear you saying that mm -hmm. <laughs> then he might object i mean <clears throat> if you are too good in that in doing that creating space um, leaving the attachment behind somehow mm -hmm. and then these problems this attachment with the real world the usual world 
comes every day, <laughs> then you might become an expert in focusing or in meditation or in mindfulness, uh, in detaching yourself from reality. Mm. And I don't know if if I express this uh, objection yeah. quite so, well. So some people say that so that detachment is a detachment from the world uh, and your real problems won't be solved that way. Mm -hmm. Where is the action? Where is the social action? Where uh, is this, this part of, uh, yeah. of, of the life? So we might, say to, we might say you must detach yourself from the social part <laughs> because that is creating your problems. <laughs> But the danger of that, that's a kind of process skipping, isn't it? It's just right, 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 right. To, to, to jump away from things and, and it, you know, it, I, I mean, what I, what I like about what you were saying, um, you know, with your, your my channel is, is that you get both the working with the things that come up in focusing and there is the space. So it's a both and. And it feels that what the one is a pathway to the other rather than mm -hmm. that you just exclude one or the other. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. That's right. Right. So it's like my Kanga. There are many selves in us. Mm -hmm. Um that brings all the attachments. There is a, a beer loving me, for example, that pops up <laughs> and makes me want to have a beer or so many different kinds of selves that, but um, if you are mindfully aware that here comes my beer drinking self, and here comes my whatever else. And if you can look at them, um, then actually you are in uh, no mind. That's what Isho would say. That's mm. what the Zen people would say. That uh, of course you, you cannot have a no self. You cannot become a no self because you have many selves. But um, as long as you don't identify with any one of them, mm -hmm. then you are actually attained no self. <laughs> so I think that's very interesting that we, that there is this beer loving me, but I know that that's not all, <laughs> that's not me. Yeah. Yes. And there is this other one, this other one, this other one, but these are not me. These are aspects of me, but they're not me. Yeah. So, so that's very interesting. Um, so I think this, uh, avenue of mindfulness and focusing is, uh, a pretty much developing avenue. And, uh, I, I would think that, um, especially in this part of the world, uh, there might be more of a of interest in developing that area. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would hope it would develop everywhere. Yes, <laughs> yes. So we need to stop now or do you have a few minutes more? I have a few, just a, a few minutes more, and I could be late for the next meeting. I don't think. No, 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 no. <laughs> People are usually late. <laughs> if if you need to go, then we can. Yeah, start. I have a few minutes. Yeah. I, I, do we have enough footage? Yes, yep. more than enough. That was so interesting. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's very I, I wanted to ask you about the body because you say about experiencing, re-experiencing body and space somehow the four mm. elements of focusing so 
אוקיי, אנימלס, אנימליטי, אורגניזם, the organism, the animality, the bodies, somewhere there. Mm. Maybe you, you would like to say a little bit more about that, about this element, the body. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think what's really important, you know, it's not really um, the physical body, uh, because Gene doesn't mean the physical body when he says the body. Uh, but I think what is really important is uh, that the body is the subject. Um, usually in medicine, for example, the body is the object. Mm -hmm. So the scientist subject ob observes with a microscope uh, certain cells of the body, but the cells are the object of his observations. Mm -hmm. But who is the one that is observing, mm -hmm. right? And that's always a mystery in science. Okay, so there's lots of objective facts, but who is the one who observed it? Okay, so Gene's body is the subject body. Mm -hmm. So we have two bodies. Uh, The, the body as an object and the body as a subject. Because if there's a bodily felt sense here, that seems to be telling me something. If something isn't right, for example. Then this felt sense is a subject. It's telling me something. But in a sense that I'm observing this felt sense, it is also an object. So when we think of the body, we... in the focusing way, we have actually transcended the subject-object cleavage. So, I, I, for me right now, I, I think this is very fascinating because a lot of people talk about the body as an object. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, tendencies in, to go that way and try to explain everything away with neuroscience, for example. But these concepts are objects of somebody's thinking. And it's the body actually, as Jean has it, is not the object, it's the subject. So here's a distinction that I really want to make about um, mind and body that in fact uh, we are both mind and body and we are both both are the subject and uh, it's not right to think of the mind as the observing subject mm -hmm. and the body as the object of observation mm -hmm. yes yeah that sounds cool <laughs> <Doesn't it? laughs> <That'd be cool. laughs> and actually in this uh, sort of dialogue we had uh, it, it is like I am hearing parts of the book Judy <laughs> Absolutely. I think you will be very interested because it does it, you have touched on so many things as Nikos says that are in the book Oh, great, 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 great. It, it, uh, there are a lot of edges in the book. Right, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That connect with what, what some of the things you've been talking about, but I love the body as subject. I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing to take away from this. Yeah. All right, so... so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. it's been uh, <laughs> wonderful. I enjoy talking to you. No, thank you so much. And I must say, I, when I reread your chapter, I, I just thought, oh, this is a brilliant chapter. I love it. It's, so, <laughs> it's so clear, well-constructed and uh, so, so interesting. So it's been a real delight to be able to talk to you. Right. You. So, yes, thank you. No, thank you so much for giving up your time. That's really... No, you're, you're welcome. I just enjoy it. And thank you also for all the help you've given 
to the With, group along the way. Yes, yes. You know, oh, 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 you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A lot of work. <laughs> I know, I know. So, goodbye to you too. Okay. Let's stop the recording. Okay.
Ang dali cool. And actually, in this uh, sort of dialogue we had, uh, it is like I am hearing parts of the book, Judy. <laughs> Because we have uh, other people explaining more about these issues that you talked about, Akira. Okay, good. I have to read the book. <laughs> Looking forward to read the book. <laughs> And they, they, they are big books, two big books. <laughs> I know, it's going to take some time. <laughs> yes. When, so is, when is it coming out? This uh, summer, hopefully. Okay, yeah. good, good, yeah. Yes.